It's time for another dive into the magical world of Spyro the Dragon, and today we're going to look into the history of the most notorious game in the series, Spyro Enter the Dragonfly. This game is well known for its dodgy graphics, long loading times, and seemingly endless amount of glitches, and I could have saved myself the trouble by glossing over it and playing a hero's tale instead, but I kind of wanted to give it a go, especially as it's been about 15 years since I last played it, and I've forgotten pretty much everything. Though having played through it now, I'm starting to wonder whether I've forgotten about the game because it's been so long, or my brain is trying to block it out from my memory, because good lord this was not a pleasant experience at times. I did manage to 100% the game so I can show you guys everything there is, but it took much cursing and fist shaking, so I hope you're grateful. And just to show you what I had to put up with playing this game, here's a mini montage of some of the bugs, glitches and mistakes I ran into. How do we get ourselves into these messes, pal? Now that's out of the way, let's get on with the video and start with development. If you know your Spyro history, or watched my previous Spyro video, you'll know that Enter the Dragonfly was the first in the series not to be made by Insomniac Games. Instead, Universal Interactive hired Equinox Digital Entertainment and Check 6 Studios to make the first Spyro game on the GameCube and PlayStation 2. The game was originally going to be about the return of Nasty Nork and Ripto, who would team up and bring about the downfall of the dragons by stealing their dragonflies. The game would feature 120 dragonflies to collect, 25 realms to explore, and due to the power of the PS2 and GameCube, a steady 60fps for the NTSC version and super fast loading times. Unfortunately, none of that really happened. What could have been a potentially fantastic follow-up to Year of the Dragon turned into a nightmare for Equinox and Check 6, when Universal Interactive forced them to rush the game to make the Christmas 2002 deadline. Instead of featuring those 120 dragonflies and 25 realms we were promised, the developers only managed 90 dragonflies and 9 realms, even if you include the boss arena. And this was all located in just one homeworld. To put that into perspective, and if you include boss arenas and secret areas, Spyro 1 had 29 realms and 6 homeworlds, Spyro 2 26 realms and 3 homeworlds, and Spyro 3 32 realms and 4 homeworlds. On top of this, the smooth frame rate is virtually non-existent. I used an emulator to play into the Dragonfly on a decent computer, and even that wasn't enough to stop my game dipping to 15 frames and sometimes freezing up altogether. The only thing I didn't have too much of an issue with was the loading times, but that's because I remember them taking over a minute on the PS2, if the game didn't just crash altogether. While I haven't found an exact date for when the development started, I did find an old IGN article from February 2002 which announced Universal's plans for a new Spyro game. Enter the Dragonfly was released November 2002, which means at most, Equinox and Check 6 were probably given a year, maybe less to make this new game. That's a year at most to come up with a fresh story, develop it for a new console and game engine, and most importantly, iron out any bugs and glitches. Needless to say, the game was considered a failure, and it ended up being the only game Equinox Digital Entertainment and Check 6 Studios would ever release. Story, World and Characters The story of Enter the Dragonfly begins shortly after Year of the Dragon. A party is being held to celebrate the giving of dragonflies to the baby dragons which were rescued in the previous game. Spyro, Sparks, Hunter, Bianca and a number of baby dragons and dragonflies are in attendance, when suddenly a crack of lightning hits the ground and a portal appears. Out comes none other than Ripto, the antagonist of Spyro 2. He's even brought his minions, Crush and Gulp. 
After a little speech, Ripto wastes no time in poofing away all the dragonflies, including Sparks. Luckily, he's not a very good sorcerer, and Bianca realises that Sparks hasn't gone far and guides Spyro to him. Bianca then comes up with the idea of empowering Spyro with different breath abilities that will help him in retrieving the lost dragonflies. Unfortunately, she seems just as hopeless with her magic as Ripto, and while Spyro can technically use different breath attacks now, she explains he'll have to find particular dragon runes to enable each one. It's then that the plucky purple dragon and his sparkly sidekick set off to find the dragonflies and collect all the magic runes. And that's pretty much the story. It's a little basic, but seeing as Spyro 1 followed the same formula, I can't really complain. Bad guy makes an appearance, bad guy does something bad guy-ish, and Spyro sets off to save the day. But while the story has an excuse to be basic, the world doesn't, especially on a brand new powerful console like the PS2 and GameCube. And yet, we have only one homeworld to explore, the Dragon Realms. Even though the Dragon Realms was the collective term for all the homeworlds of Spyro 1, this time around it's treated as its own playable world. The terrain varies depending on the nearby realm, and not all these areas will be accessible from the get-go, as special gates stand in Spyro's way which can only be unlocked with certain breaths. While it is the only homeworld, it's beautiful to look at, and comes with many different environments to explore. Grass, farmland, beach, snow, desert, and even jungle areas. So let's talk about those eight realms, as they're a little different to how they were in previous games. For starters, there's no portal entrance. Instead, Spyro makes use of vehicles or magic, which are usually themed around the realm they transport him to. Oddly, however, he uses a portal to leave the realm, but somehow ends up back on the transportation he used to arrive. To make things even more confusing, mini-games inside the realms have portal entrances too, and look very similar to the ones he leaves the realm through. In order to unlock the realms, Spyro will need to collect a certain amount of dragonflies. The first realm Spyro will visit is Dragonfly Dojo, and the mode of transportation is a flying rock. The environment is as you'd expect. Japanese-inspired architecture, with dojos, zen gardens, and pagodas dotted about the realm. It's home to the Dragon Masters, who teach young dragonflies how to be perfect guardians to their dragon companions. The realm has recently come under attack by Riptox, who have frozen all the Dragon Masters, so Spyro will need to use his flame breath to free them. In turn, they will unlock new areas in the realm for Spyro to explore. The Dragon Masters are all named after famous actors and martial artists. Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, Jet Li, Toshiro Mifune, and either Chow Yun-Fat or Stephen Chow, I'm not 100% sure on that last one. A few of the Dragonfly's names also relate to the film industry, with Yojimbo and Rashomon both named after the famous Japanese films of the same name by director Akira Kurosawa. Both of these films also starred Toshiro Mifune, and what's an oriental-inspired realm without ninja riptox and staff-wielding riptox? If you've been wondering about speedways in this game, you'll come across the first one in Dragonfly Dojo, because they're now treated as mini-games rather than their own separate realms. This one is called Banzai Speedway, and features similar architecture to the main realm. Giant cherry blossom trees also grow here, and the lantern objectives hang from their branches. Other objectives include rings, as usual, rickshaws, and gliding riptox, the latter being who you compete with in the race challenge. This is my favourite speedway of the game, on account of its beauty and the relaxing music that plays. The second mini-game, which seems completely out of place given the realm it's situated in, is the tank mini-game. Patton the Dragon, named after the famous General George S. Patton, gives Spyro the task of taking out all the dummy tanks using a tank himself. I really didn't enjoy this mini-game, but I'll talk about it in the gameplay section. The second realm Spyro visits is Crop Circle Country, because we just have to have a realm with UFOs and space animals. I'm not even kidding, if there hadn't been one, I'd be disappointed. The mode of transportation is of course a UFO. Crop Circle Country is set at night, with a starry dark blue sky and two ominous large moons looming over the realm. There's also thick green mist flooding the area which fits in with the creepy alien vibe. The architecture is Midwest American farm style, and the whole place bears a resemblance to Country Speedway of Spyro 3. The farmer's cows have been abducted by space riptox and locked up inside a barn, so Spyro will have to make his way through the realm to free them. The enemies don't provide much of a challenge, with the first few space riptox cowering in fear at the sight of Spyro. There's also larger red riptox with lasers and even space cows, but a simple flame breath will deal with them. 
The first minigame I found involves Spyro using a UFO to save cows from other UFOs. Spyro will need to beam up said cows and drop them into the corral before the larger space cow UFO can abduct them. Golden UFOs will try to stop Spyro by shooting at him, but seeing as you don't take any damage it's not too difficult, just long-winded. The second minigame, which I didn't actually find until I came back to the realm later, is a platform challenge. Why are all these minigames so well hidden? Spyro will need to make his way around the area and head bash buttons on the ground that will lower certain platforms. He'll then need to glide to each platform and power up the poles with his electric breath, which will in turn bring down another set of platforms. This carries on until he makes his way to the centre of the platform, where a red space riptop will be waiting. Flame him and you're done. Next up is Luau Island, a tropical island realm which Spyro can reach using the boat in the Dragon Realm's dock. Sandy beaches, large bodies of water and cliffs that Spyro can climb make up this realm. The pig tourists on Luau Island have been captured by the Riptox who intend to eat them for dinner, so it's Spyro's job to rescue them. They all have stereotypical piggy names like Porkins and Hammy, whereas some of the dragonflies you find seem to be named after the great philosophers of ancient times. Plato, Homer, Socrates, Scuttlebutt? On the way through the realm, Spyro will encounter idle monsters that you'll probably recognise from the second game, scuba diving Riptox and tourist Riptox, who seem friendly at first but won't waste time snapping at Spyro. That's biting snapping, not taking photo snapping. Mini games include helping Hunter recover his baby manta rays, which he of course turns into a competition, and a drumming competition which comes in two stages. The first is relatively easy, but the second stage is a lot more challenging on the old memory banks, unless you have a pen and paper handy. Next up is Cloud9, which is accessed via the swirly whirly magic thing. As the name suggests, Cloud9 is situated high up in the sky, with buildings floating on top of clouds surrounded by mist. Spyro will have to make a lot of use out of his gliding here, as the teddy bear inhabitants didn't think to build bridges to traverse their realm. Spyro needs to help the bears activate their hourglass which have been turned off by the dastardly Riptox, resulting in some very sleepy air signs. Personally, I think they missed a trick by not naming the teddies after Care Bears. Instead, we have Pudgy, Powder, Thimble, Nimble, Danny, and Pudgy again. Only this time his voice has changed. Please, save us from the battleships! Hooray! You did it! Maybe Pudgy is a really common name in this universe? You know, like Ice Boy or even Tashi Station. In fairness, I think Tashi Station is a Star Wars reference. But I was going into Tashi Station to pick up some power converters. But I digress. In order to reactivate the hourglass, Spyro will need to power up various machines with his electric breath. Along the way, Riptock angels armed with pillows, bows and arrows will try to stop him. And there are even angry storm clouds that will zap Spyro if he gets too close. The minigame you'll most likely come across first will be Rainbow Speedway, which is designed more or less the same as the main realm. Clouds, rainbows and floating buildings. Objectives are rings, stars, go-karts and Riptox flying beds like the one in bed knobs and broomsticks. The flying Riptox will then take Spyro on in a race. The second minigame is very easy and involves Spyro flying a Spitfire plane in order to take out the floating battleships attacking Puffy Palace. Those pesky Riptox and beds will try and stop Spyro, but they can be easily outmaneuvered in his far superior Spitfire. Monkey Monastery is up next, which is accessed via a balloon ship. The Monkey Monks, ha ha, are a friendly bunch who just want to live in peace high up in their snowy mountain home. But of course, their peace is disturbed by Ripto's invading minions, who have taken over the monastery and even frozen solid the local Yeti populace. Look, it's our old friend Bartholomew! Sadly, there's no sign of Bentley in this game, and Bart doesn't even make a mention of his older brother. Maybe they had a falling out or something. Spyro will need to free the Yetis with his flame breath, clear out the various Rhinox wielding clubs and shields, and even kill a few mammoths while he's at it. Also, I want to point out this monk dude, who sets you the task of killing the flying Riptox who are apparently guarding the Yetis trapped within the ice. Firstly, they don't look anything like Riptox, just some poor Pteranodons who ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. Secondly, they don't appear to be guarding anything and seem to be minding their own business flying around the mountains. Thirdly, getting me to kill them is not very monk-like of you, Brother Marcus. I thought you guys practiced divine compassion and all that. 
The first minigame I found involved a slide, which gave me horrible flashbacks to the slide minigames in Crystal Islands and Haunted Tomb from Spyro 3, but I was surprised to find this one quite enjoyable. The fast pace is a nice change to Spyro's sluggish movements, and controlling him even at this speed isn't too difficult, at least for me. The second minigame once again involves shooting stuff in a Spitfire plane, and is even easier this time around than the one in Cloud 9. Just spam the rocket button and shoot at the Rhinoc bases. The enemies don't even make much of an attempt to fight back. It's really odd, but eh, I'm not going to complain. Now this is where things got a bit confusing for me, mainly because I'm a herpadup. I was supposed to go to Honey Marsh next, but I somehow completely forgot that realm existed, and was wondering why I didn't have enough dragonflies for what I thought was the next realm, Thieves' Den. So I did a bit of backtracking, collected enough dragonflies, and proceeded to do that realm instead. Anyway, let's do this in the correct order and talk about Honey Marsh, which Spyro can get to with the use of a honeycomb float. Honey Marsh reminds me of Honey Speedway of Spyro 3, but while I didn't really like the look of the latter, I find this place quite charming. The giant flowers, the thunderstorm and sound effects in the background, even the platforming is very enjoyable. Spyro must help the crocodile inhabitants by turning off the honey stills draining all their honey. Along the way, banjo playing and laser blasting Riptox will try and stop him, as well as a bunch of angry bees who will shoot their stingers at Spyro. There are two mini games in Honey Marsh. The first is another tank mini game. Hooray! Spyro has two and a half minutes to get through the entire course and shoot all the targets and bees. It's not particularly difficult, more tedious when the rockets the tank fires don't seem to travel more than six feet. The second is another slide mini game. It's probably my least favourite of the three that are in Enter the Dragonfly, because jumping over logs can be awkward at times, but it's certainly gorgeous to look at so that makes up for it. Now we can move on to Thieves' Den, which Spyro can get to by riding a magic carpet. This was one of my favourite realms to explore in Enter the Dragonfly. I just love the look of this place. It reminds me of the Cave of Wonders in Aladdin, and you even get into the main part of the realm by travelling through the mouth of a giant stone dragon. I'm also a big fan of the thieves and all the silly noises they make, so finding out there's a realm dedicated to them made me very happy. One of the thieves is named Footpad, which is old terminology for a thief who attacks pedestrians, and two of the dragonflies are named Morpheus and Neo, though I'm not sure as to why the Matrix reference. Maybe it's becoming a staple of Spyro games. Thieves' Den is basically one enormous cave filled to the brim with stolen treasure, and Spyro will need to stop the Riptop wizards who have magic the thieves' treasure into pesky little critters. While the living treasure isn't a problem for Spyro, as the most it'll do is run away from him, the Riptop wizards can be a pain to defeat, as Spyro can only do so by deflecting their magic back at them with the use of Wing Shield. It's not as easy to aim as you think. You'll come across the last speedway of the game here, named Oasis Speedway, situated in a desert with a mix of Egyptian and Arabian architecture. Pyramids, grand palaces, obelisks, and so on. Objectives include rings, thieves on magic carpets, cobras in baskets, and finally two-legged camels, just like the ones in Spyro 2's Scorch Realm. The race section of the speedway will put Spyro up against the magic carpet thieves, the second minigame is another platform challenge, and oh boy, this one was a toughie for me, mainly because of my lack of patience. You really need to take this one slow and think about where to jump and glide, but even that won't always save you from the dodgy platforming mechanics. Now we come to the last realm of the game if you don't count the boss, Jurassic Jungle, accessed by a strange bubble device created by the mouse scientist Dr Whiskers. I said Thieves' Den was one of my favourite realms to explore, this is the other. I mean, a realm based on two film series I adore, Jurassic Park and Terminator, what's there not to like? Well, besides that one minigame I'll get to in a minute. Jurassic Jungle is a mixed environment, with areas of dense flora, lakes and rivers of lava, large caves, and a ziggurat taking up the rest of the space. The scientists of Jurassic Jungle have been busy creating robot Riptox called R1000s and T-Rex-1000s, hee hee, and all hell breaks loose when said Riptox escape from containment and cause havoc in the jungle. Spyro will need to destroy the robots before they cause even greater problems for the scientists. The two mini-games in this realm involve a long slide down a very steep volcano, and this. I hate this mini-game so much. Spyro needs to climb to the top of the Tower of Scary and Ridiculous Heights to receive the tower's secret treasure, but the climbing is so bad at times I wanted to pull my hair out. 
There's pointless boulder traps that are only there to make you waste time trying to figure out how to get past them. Dart traps which you can't see half the time because the camera won't look up when Spyro moves sideways. Rows of spiders to avoid. And to top it all off, if Spyro gets hit and falls to the bottom, he'll probably get caught in an endless loop of taking damage and eventually die. The best bit of it all though? The treasure doesn't actually exist and you did all this for a measly dragonfly. What? So I did all that for nothing? My thoughts exactly, Spyro. Now, I don't know if it's midway through the game or after a certain realm, but a cutscene will play at some point showing Ripto, Crush and Gulp arriving in a throne room. It must take time to travel via those portals of his, because even though I've been collecting dragonflies for the last four hours by this point, Ripto has only just realised said dragonflies are nowhere to be seen. It's then that Crush pipes up and tells Ripto that something went wrong with his scepter and the dragonflies are now scattered about the realms. After taking his frustrations out on poor Crush and Gulp, Ripto then announces he'll send his Riptox out to catch all the dragonflies and deal with Spyro once and for all. Honestly, it's a really out of place cutscene that I feel should have come straight after the one where Spyro finds Sparks at the beginning of the game. The threat of sending out his minions to stop Spyro doesn't have much effect as I've been dealing with him the entire time, and I can't help but get the impression this is another result of rush development. The developers probably intended to have multiple cutscenes like Year of the Dragon, but having run out of time and not wanting to use all their cutscenes at the beginning of the game, they put it here instead. Once you've finished every realm and entered the Dragonfly, you'll be able to take on Ripto. You can get to him via the circular portal in the main area of the Dragon Realms, and his arena consists of a platform surrounded by a lake of lava and mountains on all sides. Ripto is the only boss of the game. Being the only boss, You'd think the developers could put a bit of effort into making the fight interesting, but I guess they ran out of time for that too. Ripto's boss battle comes in one, two or three stages, depending on your progress in the game. Anything below 85% will only give you the first stage. In this round, Ripto will magic up a wall of ice to protect himself. Spyro will need to chase him around the arena and flame the ice wall until it disappears, all while trying to avoid Ripto's spells. Once the ice wall is gone, Ripto is vulnerable to Spyro's attacks. One charge or breath will finish him off, and, if you've got less than 85% completion, Ripto will do his I'll be back speech, and the game will end. No, really, that's it. No final cutscene, just roll credits. If you get anything between 85 and 99% completion, you'll be treated to a second round with Ripto. I wouldn't get your hopes up too high though. It's pretty much the same as the first round, only this time Ripto uses a flame wall to protect himself, and Spyro will have to make use of his ice breath instead. Oh yeah, and Ripto has doubled in size for some reason. It doesn't help him in any way, and actually makes the fight a lot easier, because being so big, he can't put as much distance between himself and Spyro. So finish off the flame wall, whack Ripto, listen to the I'll be back speech, and roll credits again. The third and final stage is where things get changed up a little bit, and is only available if you 100% complete the game. Ripto will magic himself into a hulking monstrosity and use two different ice attacks against Spyro. The first is where he slams his scepter into the ground and sends out a ring of ice, which can be avoided by jumping. The second attack is an ice projectile which Spyro can avoid by charging around the arena. Occasionally, Ripto will get his scepter stuck in the ground and it's then that Spyro can use his electric breath to give him a good zap. Repeat a number of times and you'll finally defeat Ripto. Instead of credits, you're now treated to a cutscene. Ripto will throw a temper tantrum about how his magic scepter has failed him a second time before escaping through one of his portals. Another cutscene will play showing the Dragonfly party back in full swing. Both Sparks and Hunter will make a comment about how everything is back to normal, and then Spyro turns to the camera and winks. Roll credits. Really? 100% completion and that's what I get. No secret bonus realm, no special abilities to make the game more fun, just a fourth wall break. Now you may notice I didn't go into much detail about any of the characters of Enter the Dragonfly. Well, that's because there isn't really anything new to say about them. Apart from the Spirit Dragon statue, who only announces the new ability you've learned from a rune, and various NPCs in each realm, we've seen every character before, and most of them behave the same way they did in previous titles. The only exceptions are Crush and Gulp who can now speak. Oh yeah! What do we want this time, boss? But they had such small roles in Enter the Dragonfly, they're hardly worth mentioning. 
Other characters that barely show up include Moneybags, who only makes one appearance in the entire game, and Bianca, who's only seen once outside of cutscenes. I'm assuming these characters had bigger roles in early game development, but got cut to save time. So let's just forget about that and move on to… Gameplay. Just a heads up, this is where most of my gripe for the game comes from. There isn't a great deal of good to say about the gameplay, so I just thought I'd let you know I may get a bit grumpy here. In terms of controls, Enter the Dragonfly plays more or less the same as Year of the Dragon, with a few extras thrown in. It's still circle to breath attack, square to charge, X to jump and again to glide, and triangle to hover at the end of a glide, look around while stationary, and of course head bash. The newest abilities Spyro will learn are his various breath attacks and wing shield. These are taught by finding and collecting various runes scattered about the realms. The first one you'll come across is the bubble breath rune, found as soon as you start the game. Bianca explains that taking it to the spirit dragon statue will infuse dragon magic with her magic and grant Spyro the power of bubble breath. The only use this has in the game is to catch those pesky dragonflies, which might I add is a pain in the backside to do. Just stand still! Also, while we're on the topic, remember when Bianca told us the dragonflies were quite shy? Yeah, that doesn't sound shy to me. The next rune you'll come across is the Electric Breath rune, found in Dragonfly Dojo. This is my preferred breath attack because it has a number of uses. Not only can it be used to kill regular enemies like Flame Breath does, it also comes in handy in various realms such as Crop Circle Country and Cloud9, and mini games like the platforming challenges. Plus, I love the sound effect. Now the third rune, found on Luau Island, isn't actually a breath, it's the rune to learn Wing Shield. In terms of useless abilities, this one takes the cake. The only time it comes in use is in Thieves' Den to deflect the Riptock Wizard's magic abilities back at them. I'm assuming Wing Shield would have had a lot more use than the 25 realms that were initially planned, but we'll just have to imagine what for. Last but not least is the Ice Breath rune, found in Cloud9. Ice Breath has very little use in my opinion, only one up from Bubble Breath. It's only necessary for three things, getting the baby dragon's kites in Dragonfly Dojo, freezing solid the R1000s in Jurassic Jungle, and defeating Ripto in his second stage. Sure, you can freeze large enemies solid with Ice Breath and then use your charge attack to kill them, but why do all that when you can just flame or electric breath and kill them in one go? Plus, Electric Breath is awesome. To cycle through all of Spyro's different breath attacks, you'll need to hit L1. R1 is used to show the inventory, though I hardly ever looked at it myself. The most you'll carry at one time is a rune or key, not exactly difficult to remember. And apart from Sparks' abilities to spot treasure by holding down the L3 and R3 buttons, that's it in terms of controls. Obviously, they do vary depending on the situation, but I'm not going to go into detail on those because I'm just too lazy. So instead, let's talk about how it feels to control Spyro throughout the game. Short answer, not great. Long answer, oh boy. After enjoying the controls of Year of the Dragon, Enter the Dragonfly feels extremely sluggish. For starters, Spyro moves like he's wading through treacle, at least he seems to on the PAL version. I wouldn't mind as much if he didn't also turn like an 18-wheeler truck. Oh, and that charge speed, am I right? You can imagine how fun this is when I'm chasing down dragonflies that 180 at complete random. Well, at least they can't mess up the platforming part of the game, right? Oh dear. Nearly every jump and glide in this game has me biting my nails because it's so difficult to tell if Spyro will make it. The worst realms for me were Cloud9 with those weird jumps near the end of the realm, and funnily enough, Thieves' Den. It was so dark in parts of this realm that I couldn't see if I cleared the edge of the platform or not though admittedly, this could be down to the brightness settings on the TV I was using. But the one bit of platforming I hoped to never, ever do again was definitely the Electric Pole minigame, the second one in particular. It takes so long to complete that you start trying to cut corners to make it go faster, which almost always ends in Sparrow plummeting to his death and having to start all over again. On top of this, trying to time your glide and hover so that Sparrow will land on an oncoming platform is really difficult. Not just in this minigame, but throughout Enter the Dragonfly. Stop flapping and just land! Then there's the camera. We all know cameras in Spyro games are not great, but this one is a bloody nightmare. It gets stuck on walls, it decides to look down when I begin a jump, and my personal favourite, it sometimes zooms in on Spyro's butt when I try to look forwards. 
Spyro's climbing and swimming abilities aren't much to write home about either. For some reason, though Spyro moves incredibly slowly on the ground, the developers decided to make him shoot up ladders at Mach 1 speed. And the swimming, you know, that mechanic everybody hates but Insomniac Games managed to make enjoyable? Yeah, that sucks in this game too. If turning on land is bad, turning in water is diabolical, making gem collection in lakes a very unpleasant experience. Head Bash is the only one of the three abilities that hasn't been bodged, but it's used so little in this game it's not really worth mentioning. It's not all bad though, I personally enjoyed the look and controls of the Speedway realms, particularly Banzai Speedway as I said before. The mini games themselves weren't much to write home about, Time Attack plays the same as it always has, though now you have a set amount of time rather than getting extra time from objectives, the racing challenges are incredibly easy, and there's no secret mini game to be found but I just loved the way Spyro moves in these speedways. I could honestly spend hours in here listening to the music and watching Spyro soar and dive. And back to the bad. Besides collecting dragonflies, you'll also need to find all the gems scattered about the realms if you want the full Ripto boss battle experience. Nothing new there, collecting gems has always been a staple of Spyro games. So why is it bad? Draw distance. I frequently found myself returning to areas and finding lone gems I hadn't picked up. I could have sworn I checked and double checked this part of the realm though. Well, in earlier Spyro games, you could see a gem from further away before the draw distance unrendered it. Not only that, if a gem was far off in the distance, you couldn't see its shape, but it would sparkle occasionally to let you know it was there. Enter the Dragonfly doesn't use a sparkle animation for gems, at least from what I've seen, and the draw distance is so small that I found myself frequently missing gems only a few metres away from Spyro. Combined with how awkward it is to control him, having to backtrack to find that one last gem the game wouldn't render for you is a pain. So what about the minigames? While there may not be that much variety between them, they're a mix in terms of difficulty. For example, one of the first minigames you come across is the tank minigame in Dragonfly Dojo. The goal is to shoot all the dummy tanks before they destroy Spyro's tank, which I found incredibly difficult to do from third person. And once I'd been hit, I couldn't seem to get away before the dummy tank shot again, so you can guess how well my first couple of attempts went. In the end, I moved through the area incredibly slowly and made sure to shoot everything from a distance in first person mode. It took forever, but hey, I wasn't being timed, so who cares? By contrast, the mini games that involve the Spitfire are shockingly easy, even though they appear halfway through the game. For example, in the first Spitfire minigame, I completely ignored the Rhinox shooting at me by moving a bit to the left or right, and fired rockets like crazy at the battleships. I repeated this over and over, circling around the area until all the battleships had been destroyed. The second Spitfire minigame in Monkey Monastery was even easier. I managed to destroy all the Riptop bases in about 45 seconds, which means loading into the area and talking to the NPC both times took longer than the actual challenge. I also found the three slide minigames quite easy for the most part, apart from those annoying logs in the Honey Marsh slide. The most difficult challenges for me were definitely the electric platform ones. As I've discussed earlier, platforming in this game can be an absolute nightmare, and if you rush everything like I do, you're gonna have a bad time. Besides the main objectives and minigames, there'll sometimes be a side mission to complete in the realm. Dragonfly Dojo's side mission involves retrieving the baby dragon's kites from the trees, and is the only one you have to backtrack for as you need to freeze solid the dragons and step on top of them. Crop Circle Country is zap the cows you saved to herd them towards Farmer Dean, Monkey Monastery take out the Riptop Pteranodon creatures, Honey Marsh destroy the beehives, and Jurassic Jungle retrieve the science equipment. On top of these side missions, there are also breath challenges in various realms, including the main hub. Just like the mini-games, these tend to vary greatly in difficulty. I found the very first one you do with the Scarecrows quite tedious, as a couple of the targets are very far out and the game gives you barely enough time to get them all. By contrast, the one in Jurassic Jungle, the last one you'll do might I add, was incredibly easy. All the poles were in close proximity to each other and I finished it with half the time remaining. Then you have the buggy ones like the Ice Breath Challenge in the main hub. The first time I attempted this one, only half the fires I needed to put out were lit. I assumed it was a mixed challenge, where I had to put out half and light the other half, but no, turns out it was just broken. Yippee! So moving on, music and voice work. Thankfully there is something good that came out of this game, and that's the soundtrack. 
Stuart Copeland made his fourth and final appearance as composer on the Spyro series with Enter the Dragonfly, and once again he didn't disappoint. I know people have their favourite Spyro soundtrack, and this one is sometimes considered his weakest, but I personally love the music of Enter the Dragonfly. In fact, after playing through the game again and giving it a good listen, it could be my favourite so far. The title theme alone is great, and reminds me of Spyro 1's theme, which I'm sure all Spyro fans can agree is an awesome piece of music. I noticed Stuart used more vocals for Enter the Dragonfly soundtrack than the other Spyro soundtracks combined, even if the words are gibberish. As far as I can remember, Spyro 1 made no use of vocals, Spyro 2 only had vocals for Magma Cone, and Spyro 3 had a couple, depending on your game's region. There are so many examples of vocals in Enter the Dragonfly that I couldn't list them all, but three of my personal favourite themes are Banzai Speedway, Monkey Monastery, and Platform Peril. The music really sets the tone of the realm you're in, and it's so good to listen to that I don't mind falling off that darn platform 14 million times. In terms of voice work, the cast of Year of the Dragon returned for Enter the Dragonfly, but just like Stuart Copeland, most of them did not come back for further instalments in the series. New additions to the voice cast include Billy West, Darren Norris, Dee Baker, Jeannie Elias, and surprisingly, Michael Dawn. Billy West voiced a lot of the realm's inhabitants, including Rod Tacchini, the Pig Tourists, and the Gators. Outside of Spyro, he is perhaps best known for providing the voices of various characters in Futurama, but he has done tons of voice work over the years. Darren Norris, while only listed as additional voices in Enter the Dragonfly, has voiced well-known characters such as Cosmo and Mr. Turner and Fairly Odd Parents, and even antagonist Vincent from Cowboy Bebop the movie. Dee Baker is a master at animal vocalisations, as well as a great voice actor in general, so it's no surprise he provided the voices and noises of the thieves and space cows. If you've ever watched Phineas and Ferb, and heard the strange noises Perry the Platypus makes, guess what? Dee Baker made those noises himself. He also voices Klaus the Fish for any American Dad fans out there. Jeannie Elias had a small role in Enter the Dragonfly, only voicing the baby dragons. While she hasn't had very notable roles outside the game, she has provided additional voices for pretty much every show out there. Just check out her IMDb page. Lastly, we come to Michael Dawn, who is also listed as additional voices for the game. If you don't know who Michael Dawn is, I guess you're not a Star Trek fan, as this guy played one of my favourite characters from the series, Lieutenant War. In terms of voice acting, perhaps his most notable role is that of I Am Weasel from one of Cartoon Network's most successful series, I Am Weasel, but he's done so many roles over the years there's too many to list. Now, normally I end this part after discussing voice actors and their various roles, but I want to go into a bit more detail here, as I don't think I've ever played a game with quite so many voice acting issues and hiccups. Hi. I don't hold the voice actors or even the developers at fault for this, I think the publishers rushing development are to blame. But honestly, how does something like this get put in the game? Wanna practice writing down the honey slide again? Okay, come back anytime! His voice completely changed! Not only this, but that voice line is used again for another NPC, only slowed down. It seems as if the volcano has stabilised. Okay. Come back anytime. This was slightly jarring playing through the first time, and actually had me in a fit of laughter after the conversation ended. The voice line doesn't even suit either character. The gators usually have a stereotypical hillbilly accent, and the mouse scientists have thick German accents. Then there's those bits of dialogue where you just know they forgot to record something, and had to get another voice actor to fill in. <laughs> On top of this, there's moments where NPCs just won't speak their lines, and mispronunciations abound. Hey, it's tested. But enough laughing about the dodgy voice work, let's move on to the final part. 
sales and critical reception. Sale-wise, Enter the Dragonfly actually did rather well, but I guess that's because it was riding on the success of Year of the Dragon. Just like its predecessor, the PS2 version of Enter the Dragonfly received a Platinum Sales Award from the Entertainment and Leisure Software Publishers Association for selling over 300,000 units in the UK. High sales don't indicate high quality though, and reviews for Enter the Dragonfly ranged from mixed to negative. While critics praised the wonderful soundtrack and some even liked the graphics, others were not impressed by the pace of the game, boring story, and how there was nothing particularly new brought to the table. GameSpot gave the game a meta score of 28, stating, A train wreck of a game that has no direction, no technical merit, and little appeal except as a game design house of horrors and a showcase for some good music by Stuart Copeland. G4TV wrote, Check 6 Studios has clearly designed this instalment of the Sparrow franchise for very young gamers, and with that demographic, the title works well. Unfortunately, this limited scope will bore anyone familiar with other platforming titles. To this day on game rankings, the PS2 version of Enter the Dragonfly holds a 55.58% rating based on 39 reviews, and the GameCube version holds a 47.76% rating based on 23 reviews. Now, I'd like to give my thoughts and opinions on the game, as honestly, I don't think it's atrocious. I know you might not get that impression from listening to what I've said, particularly in the gameplay section, but hear me out. I'm not going to deny that the game is flawed, the amount of bugs I've run into alone is proof of that, but there are some things I really enjoyed about Enter the Dragonfly. You already know I love the soundtrack, so that's one thing, but I actually don't mind the graphics either, despite what critics say. After being used to the graphics of the first three games, I have to say the graphics here are quite jarring, at first. As the game went on though, I started to appreciate them more. Sure, a lot of the characters look really freaky and have weird mouth movements, Ripto in particular, but Spyro himself looks great, and so do his animations, at least I think so. Just look at the way he flies through speedways for example. And some of the environments are fantastic, particularly Honey Marsh and Thieves' Den. For all we know as well, the graphics could have been improved upon had the developers been given more time. It does seem odd that Spyro and Sparks look so great in this world, but other characters like Bianca and Hunter seem out of place, almost as if they've been taken from another game with completely different graphics. And yeah, the story is basic, but previous Spyro stories weren't exactly the Lord of the Rings. Spyro 1 was all about freeing the dragons from Crystal and stopping Nasty Nort, and Spyro 2 had us ridding Avalar of Ripto. Spyro 3 was a bit more complicated, what with its changing allegiances and the sorceress's dark plans for the dragon eggs, but every game has more or less been a collectathon, whether it's dragons, talisman, eggs, or dragonflies. So I don't think it's fair to label the fourth game story as a major fault. Now, there are other things I didn't go into much detail about in this video, the dodgy sound effects and naff script, for example. But to be honest, I think Enter the Dragonfly has taken enough of a beating for one day, so let's leave it there. If you enjoyed this video, let me know by leaving a like. It really helps me out after all. Thank you so much for watching, guys, and join me next time for a look into Spyro, a hero's tale.